Good afternoon. Thank you all very much for being with us this afternoon. Uh, it's great to have, have you here at the United States Institute of Peace. It's, uh, it's our honor uh, to have the Deputy Prime Minister of Iraq, uh, His Excellency Dr. Salah al-Mudlaq with us uh, here this afternoon for his remarks. Um, also for your questions. And so we look forward to this conversation uh, to be able to explore the many issues having to do with uh, the Iraq, um, the United States, uh, the issues that affect both of us. Um, USIP is very pleased uh, to have been in Iraq for 10 years. Um, we've been there since uh, 2004. We've never left, uh, good times and bad. Um, and our work there, we think, has had an effect on, on, on the work um, of others, of Iraqis, uh, trying to find peaceful resolution uh, of disputes. Uh, we've worked with national and provincial leaders. Uh, but we've looked, worked on the ground. Um, the, the range of activities that we have undertaken uh, is broad. Um, we've also sponsored discussions such as this uh, with Dr. Budlock and other senior Iraqis who have come here to the United States, here to Washington, and here to the Institute of Peace. Um, we've worked in, uh, in Nineveh, uh, mitigating uh, tensions. We've been building bridges between community and police um, in Kirkuk, in Baghdad, in Karbala, in Basra. Um, we've got a, a range of activities that uh, we are we're pleased with and have just had a conversation uh, with the Deputy Prime Minister. Um, we hope that uh, this discussion today will be a, a, a next in the series of further conversations. We look forward to Dr. Mutlock's uh, remarks. The session today is in two parts. Um, we will have the first session with Dr. Mudlock. Uh, uh, we will also then t have an intermission um, where, and then we will have two members of the Iraqi Council of Representatives, the Iraqi Parliament, um, Mr. Izzat al -Shabar, is, uh, Shabandar and, and Dr. Nadia al Um We'll have an opportunity to have a conversation with you, answer questions, and, and enter into that kind of work. Um, Dr. Mudlock, let me invite you to come make your initial remarks, and then we will have an opportunity to discuss this later on. So please welcome the Deputy Prime Minister of Iraq, Dr. Salman. Shukran jazeelan. Sayyidat wa saad al Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to be among you today to talk about our vision on how to deal with the situation in Iraq and the region. With no doubt, the Middle East now is in a very uh, uh, difficult time. and uh, Iraq is part of that region. As we said before, to our brothers in the neighboring countries. Don't get so excited about the sectarianism in Iraq, if, because if it get to cross to your countries, it will uh, cut you apart. And this is what's happening now, and now the whole region is suffering from sectarianism, which Iraq priorly suffered from. And we told them also that Iraq is not the only country su suffering from terrorism. As you know, terrorism has no borders, and it's going to be uh, reaching you sooner or later. And told them to cooperate with Iraq and the Iraqis to fight terrorism. Um, wherever I, because terrorism, wherever it goes, there's violence, blood, and killing and abuse and miserable life for people. Few of them listen to us, uh, but others they were just uh, did, was n did not care, and now everybody is paying the price. Today, we want to help everybody to get rid of that disease, sectarianism and uh, the terrorism. And we can play an important role to help the region to get rid of terrorism that we all suffering from, likewise with sectarianism. Iraq has paid a high price to fight terrorism. As you all know, that Iraqis 
gave a huge price and sacrifices for to kick al-Qaeda out of Iraq. It was really an expensive price to pay. Cruelty and abuse and marginalization can create a, 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 a rich environment for terrorism and for al-Qaeda specifically. And that's why al-Qaeda is growing again in Iraq. And now we need all the effort to come together to help Iraq to get rid of that danger. Likewise, in the region, I would like to emphasize that your brothers, Sunnis, Shias, Kurds, and Arabs are quite determined to clean the country from uh, sector sectarianism and terrorism, and they really need your help. And I'm, I'm quite sure that at the end they will be able to defeat terrorism in Iraq. So we need help from the United States and the rest of the country to fight co terrorism in Iraq is, co is greatly needed. But today we need your help also to advise, give an advice to your friend in Iraq, the uh, head of the political groups, to have a kind of reconciliation in the country. Because we believe that uh, arming the Iraqi uh, army is not enough by itself. Because, you know, there is a society, a cohesive society, is needed to fight terrorism. And if you don't have these two factors, things will be really difficult. And as you know, that the uh, American uh, army with its might could not defeat al-Qaeda unless they could uh, really co uh, have the cooperation of the local people. And, uh, and uh, that's why uh, the trying to lift up cruelty and being uh, fair to the uh, citizens of these regions. And this is what we need again. So I would like to emphasize again, arming the Iraq is important, but to have a national reconciliation is also as important. We are about to uh, have an uh, election in Iraq. We only have a very short time uh, to, uh, uh, for elections to take place. It's going to be an important day in the history of Iraq. We need free elections to take place in Iraq with a lot of trans transparency, uh, monitoring, international monitoring, where also civil society from the international community to uh, take part. We need elections where you don't have curfew imposed on the people, because as you know, these two things don't go together. People won't be able to go to the polls and vote. So if, if uh, a curfew is imposed, would be an attempt to marginalize uh, some sides of party not to be part of the elections or the democratic process. We noticed what happened in the provincial council's elections when some uh, na neighborhoods uh, were forbidden to participate by imposing curfew. Then the participation rate was very low. And I think this is very dangerous, and the political representation is would not reflect the Iraqi society equally, and it will put uh, uh, obstacles on the way of the political process in Iraq. Uh, sectarianism is really a danger threatening Iraq. Probably, it's, I would say, it's more important than terrorism because it is the base for terrorism. So uh, now, uh, hearing uh, some loud voice, sectarian voice, it's just an, a way to uh, undermine the efforts for a free and good elections, and it's going to harm the country greatly. And I wish you to give an advice to all of you friends, people you know, not to escalate sectoritarianism in Iraq, whether before or after the election. 
and I think there is like a kind of fever for escalation of sectarianism taking place now in Iraq, and this is very dangerous. Uh, and uh, there is also uh, some people using some of the problems and exaggerate them to also uh, uh, help sectarianism uh, to grow bigger. And I wish for everybody to distance themselves from that uh, topic because it represents a great danger on our country and our democracy. I have uh, other commitments and won't be able to spend much time, so let's go for questions and answers. And if there's something you would like to ask me, I'll be glad to answer. And if you don't have any an uh, questions, then I would uh, uh, expand and explain more. <coughs> شكراً لهذه الملاحظات أنا سعيد to get those words out. We noticed that uh, you also wrote these words down this morning, and they appeared in the uh, Wall Street Journal uh, editorial uh, op op-ed op in, uh, in that paper where you laid out some of those issues as well. Um, uh, you come from Anbar. Yes. Um, can you give us a little sense of, uh, of the issues that you spoke about just now so eloquently in terms of sectarianism in Anbar and the and this situation on the ground in Fallujah, in Ramadi. You mentioned Al-Qaeda, uh, sectarianism as a, as a threat even larger than terrorism. Could you elaborate on, on that a little bit, please? I lived this situation in Anbar, and I'm in continuous uh, contact with what's taking place in Anbar. Al-Qaeda and uh, ISIS uh, there uh, in Ambar and Mosul, Diyarra, Baghdad, and even other uh, uh, southern uh, provinces. And I think they, they have a greater presence now in the late uh, last few months. And they represent danger, but the greater danger is when is the greater danger is when the society will step aside and don't take its role in fighting terrorism and fighting Al Qaeda, and this is exactly what I'm talking about. It's taking place in Fallujah and Ramadi, and and we're talking also about the uprise taking place on this area. It's very minor. Who Those people who are uprising are the former uh, military officers and uh, soldiers in the army, and uh, some of them Baathist. A lot of people also, they were in demonstration for a whole year asking for their uh, constitutional rights, which was never fulfilled, their demands. And we caution everybody that not complying with their demands, with the people's demand, in a peaceful way would cause them and push them to gain their demands fulfilled in a different way using violence. So fulfilling these demands in democratically uh, uh, in a, within a year would avoid that them going to use uh, the other uh, uh, alternative. So we talk to everybody, John, uh, really uh, disappoint the uh, demonstrators because you would push them to be extremists. Give them the space to express themselves peacefully in a democratic way. So the army went there to fight Al-Qaeda uh, in Ambar. The Iraqis were greeting them, they were on their side and 
But when the goal derailed to be instead of against Al-Qaeda to become against the demonstrators, then the people had a change of heart and people started to demonstrate differently. differently. Now, it's important to say that let Iraqis get unified to fight terrorism. Don't separate or marginalize people willingly because separating them or isolating them will undermine the military's efforts to fight terrorism. Uh, it's okay, uh, uh, arm the Iraqi uh, army, but parallelly, uh, we want to have people have uh, the uh, complete satisfaction and uh, to uh, that they want to fight terrorism as well with the people also people's wills to be going parallelly with the army's will. This way, all Iraqis will be unified against terrorism. Don't make these provinces or regions to be incubators for Al-Qaeda. Because they would feel that their dignity is uh, touched and hurt, and then they will uh, uh, turn they're back to you and they won't fight al-Qaeda and this, uh, this is a great danger. And we need the people to fight terrorism and sectarianism to unified with the army in the same direction to fight these two. People have some feeling that they've been, some of the people have feeling that they've been marginalized and they're not getting their rights. So. This is one country, and you have to give everybody their rights. And, uh, and if there's no stability, there won't be any development. And there's no development, no one would be happy to see Iraq going through these circumstances, whether U.S. or uh, everybody else around the world. It's important for everybody else to cooperate, to create a stabilized country, a stable country, fighting uh, sectarianism where there's no distinction or somebody would be uh, marginalized and the other given the uh, chance to work. And we want for all the sects to have their role unified in the Iraqi society. We know in the leadership of the army of Iraq does not have a, a realistic representation of the composition of the Iraqi population. And uh, there is uh, something wrong. It's imbalanced. The, the state is imbalanced. And we need to them to get to be stabilized and balanced again so that people will uh, have uh, a belief that their leadership is uh, representing everybody equally. And when people feel that they are equal with the other, they don't mind whether to, for their prime minister to be from this sect or another as far as they are doing uh, their goals. If I understand you correctly, it would be possible for the people of Anbar, the Iraqis, um, to unite, to oppose Al-Qaeda, um, and that, that weapons from the United States and recognition of the importance of dignity um, of the people of Anbar and the people of Iraq more broadly, um, that combination, you said in parallel, both the support of, uh, from the United States of, on the military side, as well as encouraging this, uh, this dialogue, this national reconciliation. Um, so, um, so the weapons, though, um, would be part of that, but not the only part of that. Exactly. Weapon alone cannot do the job. It is important, but cannot do the job. We have to go in parallel to uh, uh, strengthening the, uh, the Iraqi army, plus, plus creating the reconciliation in the country and giving the rights to the people who ask for the rights for almost more than a year. You mentioned the elections, mm -hmm. uh, elections coming up. Um, you had several qualifications and several concerns about the, 
uh, the conduct of those elections and the ability of all Iraqis uh, to participate in those elections. Um, if there are free and fair elections, what, what do you see coming out of those? More stability, um, an ability of a, of a government to be able to come together named more quickly than, than last time, coalitions forming, um, if, the, if the elections are well conducted, freely and fairly, um, what kind of an Iraqi government would you like to see coming out of those elections? <coughs> Look, I think there was a mistake which happened during the past election. Iraqi was supposed to take the chance to form the government because it won 91 seats against 89 seats. But because of the pressure from Iran, and because the United States did not act in a strong way, uh, things went in a wrong way. And in my feeling, without finding a national project, a national list, a national coalition, which will be uh, away from sectarianism, this country will not be stabilized. And it will not be kept united. So, if there is a, a transparent election and fair election, which till now I cannot see, I think there will be a fair representative of the, uh, representation of the people and things will go in, the, in a proper way. But if there will be a curfew during the election and people will be prevented from going to the ele election to elect, and if the sectarian speech will continue, the result will be uh, not promising, neither for the Iraqis nor for those who like Iraq. In the last election, as you say, there were several lists. Um, one list, as you mentioned, was uh, non-sectarian, multi-sectarian. Yeah. Do you see that? Uh, uh, will that happen again in this election? I think even the sectarian parties, they, they split now. They are not in one list. There is a possibility of forming uh, a semi-nationalist uh, list in the future, providing again the election will go in a fair and a transparent one. And there is a supervision on this election. One of the questions from the audience mm -hmm. um, asks about uh, the government formation following an election. Um, this is from uh, Mark Dewever. Um, is it likely that government formation will take as long as it did the last time? Uh, and if so, what are the implications for the security of Iraq during that period of time of government formation? Now, I cannot predict really, but it's more likely it will take time. With the split of this list, it will take some time. Staying on elections, another uh, question from the audience, um, from Eric Guf Guftason from Epic. How much of a role is foreign funding playing in Iraqi politics leading up to the election today? This is a good question. I think one of the problems that we are facing now is that uh, corruption in the country and also foreign aiding is going to play a big role in the results of the elections. I hope this will not be as much as, I, as people are expecting because uh, in the governorate election, it played a, a, a big role. So this time, it will be, it, it will, it will, uh, it will play a role. But uh, to which extent, I hope it will not be that much. But again, corruption is very high in this country, and uh, it will affect the result definitely. mentioned both in your Wall Street Journal uh, piece as well as your remarks, Dr. Murlock, um, Al-Qaeda. Um, what are the dynamics in Anbar um, and the dynamics with Syria 
um, that lead to the resurgence of al-Qaeda uh, in Iraq at this point? Well, the borders are open and they are so long, so, you know, uh, the elements of al-Qaeda are moving from one place to the another one. So definitely solving the problem of Syria would affect, would do its effect in, in, in Iraq. But we cannot wait until that time. I think, and I'm sure, that the people of Al-Anbar, by the help of the other people, if there is a, a, a guarantee that they are going to be supported, they are able to remove Al-Qaeda from Al-Anbar. But again, if justice is not going to be there, there will be a spread of violence everywhere in Iraq. And I just want my friends to remember that the violence is not only in Anbar. The, the problem in, in Diyala is even worse than in Anbar. There are people who are being displaced from their areas to, to, to other areas. And that is in, in a continuous way. This has to be stopped also. What's happening in Diyala will be reflected to, to al Anbar, to Baghdad, and to the others. And what, what you see in, 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 in Baghdad is also a huge problem. It's not, uh, less, than, uh, it's not less than, uh, or highest than, uh, less than uh, what's happening in Anbar. It is a must now that we should create the stability. If we create the stability, we'll find development. We'll find jobs for the people. But if not, this will continue. And even if we, if we defeat Al-Qaeda in that place, then maybe we'll face Al-Qaeda somewhere else. We need a, con a complete solution, a solution in which all the Iraqis will gather together by gathering their politicians. And the problem is not within the Iraqis themselves. The problem is between the politicians of Iraq. I cannot see that there are differences between the Shiites and the Sunnis to the extent that they'll fight each other. But the problem is between the politicians, and the politicians, they use sectarianism just before the election in order to get votes. But this is going to be very dangerous to the, to the country if we use it between time and time. In the governorate election, we are using that. In the uh, general election, we are using that. So in every two years, we'll have a problem of raising sectarianism again. Do the people of Iraq uh, support that sectarianism? Uh, do, do the people of Iraq want to see that kind of conflict among their, their leaders? Or are their leaders misjudging the Iraqis and, and, their, and their appeal to sectarianism in preparation for elections, leading up to elections, as you just said? I, I, you know, I could tell you that I'm definite in, my, in saying that the sectarianism is not among the Iraqis. Sectarianism is among the politicians, but they can use it to agitate people by creating some problems at a specific time, just before the election, to move the people emotionally towards a specific line. So if, if the Iraqi politicians running for office um, perceived that their constituents, whether they be Sunni, Shia, Kurdish, actually would support a multi-sector, uh, a multi-sectarian uh, party, or reject more broadly the sectarianism that you said, would that lead them? Would, would a government resulting from that kind of an election be able to pull, pull all of Iraq together? If there will be a fair election and there will be enough contribution from all the sects in the country, all the constituency in the country, I think we might reach after some time a national project. But if there be an oppression on specific constituents not to move to the election, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then this will create more imbalance in the political process and more damage and more sectarianism. But it would be better, if, of course, if people will elect without, with, regardless of the sex. Yeah. But with the uh, propaganda that some of the politicians are using before the uh, election, it's hard to see that at this moment. So you would call for Iraqi politicians not to appeal to uh, sectarianism? Not Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And I want everybody to call them, yeah. to call them not to go for sectarianism because it's really damaging to the country. Maybe they will win in the election. 
maybe they will take power in the, in the government, but they cannot govern. They cannot run the country in a proper way because they already made the damage before forming the government. And they cannot for, uh, run a government and run a country with such kind of damage. Yeah. Dr. Murlock, um, there are implications, as you've already indicated, uh, uh, of the Syrian conflict um, for terrorism, al-Qaeda support uh, in Iraq. Uh, we're approaching the, the Geneva II conference. Um, Iraqis have a great interest, I would imagine, in, uh, in that resolution. What advice, what, what guidance, what would you like to see coming out of uh, the Geneva discussions? Well, of course, what's happening in Syria is uh, annoying everybody. And uh, it is a disastrous way. If you consider how many people are being killed, how many people are being displaced, it's, it's a disaster. So I would uh, rather like to see that the opposition will be more reasonable and come and sit down and create a dialogue and get out of the situation with the minimum uh, damage that might happen to the country. I would also like to see the Russian and the Americans will come to agreement before they go there because I think most of the complication is, you know, is, a, is a, an, an outside. <coughs> some of the opposition are getting support and advices from some foreign countries and also the complication between the Russian position and the American position is making the whole situation more complicated. Dr. like another uh, question here um, on the Kurdistan region um, of Iraq. Um, uh, Alex Ebsari um, asked, the Kurdistan region of Iraq is safe, secure, and prosperous, and has been spared from the violence, by and large. Um, what role can the Kurds play in combating the uh, ISIS uh, the, uh, uh, in Anbar province? And the Kurds are doing a good job in combating you know, Al-Qaeda and IS, IS in, in their region, but they are not doing much in the other regions of Iraq. All of us would expect some more help from the Kurdish area to uh, stop the infiltration of, of Al-Qaeda to inside Iraq and also to take some measures to stop them from coming there. But their main concern now is their, play, their, their region. I don't think they are playing a big role in, mm -hmm. in, in, in defeating Al-Qaeda and the other places. Yeah. Uh, Sam Kazan at CSIS asks a question about history here. Uh, uh, you asked for America's help to fight terrorism. Last November, Prime Minister Maliki visited Washington, sat right here um, where, where you're sitting, um, and made a similar request. Um, if America's assistance is so central to Iraq's effort against extremism, why was the status of forces agreement, uh, agreement not extended at the end of, of 2011? This is a historical question, I said. It happened. It did. It happened. <laughs> <laughs> so now, are you responsible uh, about what's going on in, in Iraq? Do you want to feel that you have to participate or you just say that, okay, you didn't want us there, we are out and we are not responsible anymore? I think you have a legal and moral responsibility towards Iraq because Iraq was a united country. You came to remove Saddam Hussein regime, a dictatorship regime, towards democracy. And in fact, instead of doing that, he destroyed a country. Not only the regime. Not only the regime. Mr. Zalma is here. Can I see him? <laughs> uh, so therefore, Iraq, in my opinion, will stand up at some time and get rid of what's going on now. 
But what is needed from you and for, all, for the world, from the world uh, in general, is to help Iraq to stand as soon as possible, in a shorter time, so that the defects, the damages will be less. And again, I feel it is the responsibility of the world who decided to invade Iraq at that time, to stand for Iraq and help Iraq in such a moment. And uh, at least by the advices to your friends in the political process, to tell them, look, we are being blamed for changing the regime there. We want the real democracy to be established there, not the democracy we see now. So work together. And for those whom you have given them more than what they should get, you should tell them now that, look, you went too far, stop here, and sit with, you with, the, with your brothers and solve the problem in a peaceful way. Otherwise, if the Kurds will ex will, uh, Kurdish parties will, ex will expand from one side, and the other uh, sect will extend from other, extend from other side, then by that way, uh, uh, the problem is not going to be solved. What happened in Iraq was done by an external power. And I think the external power is still needed to rearrange things, especially for those whom you have given more than they should get. So this is a, this is a good question for all of us here in Washington. The kinds of support that you are looking for from the United States, and you've already mentioned sale of weapons, not by themselves, but certainly the sale of the weapons, um, advice to the government on inclusive, advice and, and uh, expectation of free and fair elections. Um, uh, what other advice would you give us? Uh, what other requests would you make of the, of the United States, of the U.S. government? Look, sale of weapons in parallel with the reconciliation. Because again, I don't think the weapons alone can solve the problem. The major problem is that there is no reconciliation in the country. If there is a reconciliation, maybe we need weapons, but the weapon we need may be much less than what we need now. So these two things has to go together. Do not concentrate on one aspect and leave the other aspect. Do not neglect the other aspect because still, I think uh, uh, inclusive government, fair, I mean uh, uh, sharing of power in, in this government, uh, include in, uh, the, uh, you know uh, the presence of all the component in the security decision and in the security uh, organization is a must. Now the whole security issue is linked to uh, one party, and this should should stop. Mm -hmm. And there should be uh, an organization which run the security part. Not a person, not a party. Your uh, president is the uh, command general of the army, isn't it? Commander in chief uh -huh. of the army, yes. Yeah. But he, can, he does not take the decision alone. There is an organization who tells him, okay, this should be done. We need such an organization. Mm -hmm. Deputy Prime Minister uh, Jin Suk Lee from NBC Korea asked this question. Do you think life under Prime Minister Maliki is better than life under Saddam Hussein? If so, what are the grounds that you would say so? Well, definitely life in a democratic system is better than life in a dictatorship system. But Will you tell me that life now is prosperous and good? I tell you no. Dr. Murdoch, uh, that brings the question, that brings us around to some questions of economics. Um, uh, one of the questions here is the, the energy relations between Baghdad and Erbil um, have been the source of some concern, some interest on the part of, uh, of your neighbors. 
Um, how would you describe those energy relations between uh, Baghdad and, and the Kurdish Republic? I do not agree with any decision which is going to be taken or taken now to export oil without the agreement of the central government because this will disintegrate Iraq. There is a question here that has to do with a, a, uh, a law that was recently passed uh, that uh, would have uh, the effect of, of changing the way that your government is organized. Um, uh, are there constitutional changes that need to be made? There was a, there was a you know the history of the Constitution, and, the, and there have been suggestions that the Constitution ought to be changed. What, what kinds of changes ought to be made, and how would those changes come across? Well, uh, our Constitution was written in three months' time. Mm -hmm. And that was a mistake. And during that time, we fought against that, and we stood against that, and our friend, uh, <laughs> here, right. uh, I think he remembers. Yeah, he remembers very well. One day we sat together, and he said, look, we have changed the Constitution, and we added the Article 142, which says that there will be amendment for the Constitution in four months' time. Okay, this is fair. Then we uh, thought if there will be a chance to amend the Constitution, we will agree on this Constitution, and then we'll amend it after month, four months. But there is a, you know, a phrase written with it. It says that it needs a referendum, okay. But it needs also that there is no rejection from three, two-thirds of three governorates. I told my f friend, uh, Mr. Zalmay, like, look, this means that there is no amendment for the Constitution because the Constitution was written for the benefit of a specific region. That was clear. And these three governorates will reject any changes in the Constitution. So it means this is a dead Constitution. It, you know, we cannot change it. Then the committee was established after some time, and they said for almost uh, more than six years now. No, eight years. Mm -hmm. And, uh, no, six years, eight years, yes. And nothing changed the Constitution. So unless this Constitution is going to be changed, uh, uh, amended, we are in a problem. Mm -hmm. Now, if there is a disagreement between the central government and any region, the decision is for the region, not for the central government. And that means that there is no united country, really. So unless this and other matters are going to be amended, we're still in a problem. And there are some, some, uh, art, some, some uh, matters in the Constitution that is not clear. People, uh, someone uh, understands it in a way, the other one is it in the other way. So it's always making a conflict. We voted against the Constitution. And uh, we collected at that time five million people signature to vote against the Constitution. But the Constitution passed. Uh, and, and now, if you ask Mr. Maliki, do you agree with this Constitution? Do you want it? He will say no. This Constitution is a problem. If you ask the other politicians, except the Kurds, they will say, yes, this Constitution has to be changed. But how can we change it? <laughs> Again, this is the influence of your politicians. To tell those whom you helped at that time for some reasons, let's look. The only way is to sit with your uh, brothers in the country and rearrange things again because you have taken more than you should at some time. There was a line, uh, 32, you moved more than that. Mm -hmm. This is a problem also. You have to solve it with your own uh, you know, country. 
Dr. Whitlock, uh, Joseph Scheibel from uh, the MSI Tarabot Project asks this question, and speaking of laws, uh, a revised law 21, Parliament recently passed revised law 21, uh, with much stronger language supporting decentralization. Were the ministries receptive to the revision, and have you seen them take any practical steps forward since its passage? There is a, a conflict towards that uh, Article 21, and, and maybe it will be re, uh, devised again, uh, because it gave too much authority to the governorate, too much decentralization, while these governorates, probably they are not ready for that. Hmm. They are not you know, equipped with enough professional people to run the governorate at this time, at least sometimes before we go in such a step. But the law is still there. Another set of negotiations, we talked about the Geneva negotiations. Uh, um, uh, the negotiations on Iranian policy, on Iranian nuclear policy, um, have moved along. We're now into the implementation phase of that interim agreement. Do you see any changes, any uh, strategic changes in the approach that the Iranian government is taking toward foreign policy, international relations, dealing with their neighbors, in particular with Iraq? What, what, or do you see any of that kind of change coming from your neighbor? Well, I think the negotiation is still going on. If you ask me, do you see any changes in the way the Iranian regime are dealing with Iraq? Is there something different from last year or the previous time? No, I don't see any changes. So no, uh, no recalibration, no new structure, no new policies that uh, would affect? No. Okay. Uh, staying with broader discussions, uh, developments in the wider region, in Egypt, um, in Libya, in Tunisia, um, these Arab Springs that some, like in Tunisia, seem to still be on track. Um, others, uh, like in Egypt, seem to be off track. Um, Libya is still working. How does this affect uh, Iraq? What, are, what do Iraqis think about? We in Iraq, uh, at least we, uh, the, the secular, the liberal, the nationalist people in Iraq are very happy about what's happened in, uh, what happened in, in Egypt. And we think that the Egyptians, they, uh, they uh, awaken up in a shorter time, otherwise they would have paid a bigger price. Because we, uh, we have the experience in Iraq, that this Islamist movement uh, will never create the stability in any country. Because it, it will definitely lead to sectarianism, and sectarianism will, <coughs> will disintegrate any country that it exists in. And we hope for the Egyptian to move forward, and if the Egyptian will win this time, and I think they will win, I think this will reflect itself on the other Arab countries. Egypt will have a big effect on, on, on others in the region. On Iran, um, Gerald Chandler um, asks, if Iran has a nuclear bomb, will there be an arms race? Will Saudi Arabia uh, pursue uh, a nuclear weapon? Well, if uh, Iran is going to have the, uh, the atomic bomb, then why shouldn't Saudi Arabia stop? Definitely, it's going to be a struggle in the area. And we want a cleaner area. We don't want to struggle towards you know, that kind of weapon. Uh, Brian Humphreys uh, from Rutgers University asked this question. Does the Iraqi army have legitimacy in Anbar? Frequently you hear it referred to as the Maliki forces. 
How will it be possible to fight Al-Qaeda without support of the people for the army? Al-Qaeda Al cannot be defeated without the help of the uh, people in al -Ambar, no matter how big the army is. There must be a cooperation between uh, the people of al -Ambar and other provinces and the army. If you ask me, is there a distance now between the army and the people, I will say yes. And I hope this distance will be shortened as soon as possible. A friend of yours, Mark Kimmett, mm -hmm. um, asks this question. How much of the violence sponsored by regional neighbors fighting a proxy war, how much is the violence from lack of reconciliation? If I have an information that you know what's happening in Iraq is being supported by a foreign country, I will tell you. I don't have any information of that. But definitely, the lack of reconciliation is the problem of an increasing Al-Qaeda existence in, or presence in Iraq. Deputy Prime Minister, um, several people are asking about uh, sectarianism. You've made some very strong statements, clear statements uh, on that. Um, but beyond sectarianism, um, AQI, ISIS, um, beyond those issues, um, what would be on your platform for this election coming up, your policies, your policy agenda um, for the block that you would put together? I will fight sectarianism and ISI S and Al-Qaeda at the same time. Sectarianism and Al-Qaeda are both uh, a danger to Iraq and to the region. And it has to be fought by every honest and decent person in, in this region. And that's the main main issue for you in these upcoming elections? What Are there other issues that would? No, no, I will ask for also amend, the amendment of the Constitution. Constitution, as you mentioned. I will ask for more inclusive government. I will ask for justice in this, in the coming government, in the country. And when you have justice, I think the Iraqis could live together in a proper way. Uh, Adele Sandley from IAC asks this question. What do you think of the religious parties um, in Iraq? Do you believe in separation of religion and policy, they say, or religion and the state? Of course. Of I course. mean, this is, uh, this is my platform. You like these easy questions? That, uh, <laughs> you like easy questions. <laughs> you like easy questions. <laughs> uh, Rick Welch, a retired military, um, asks. Is he here? I'm sure he's here. He wrote this. Uh, uh, yes, Rick is uh, here. Um, what is needed internally uh, to move Iraq toward genuine national reconciliation? We've, we've had some of this discussion already. He, he goes on to ask, what can the U.S. do to help that general national reconciliation? And what legal obligations do you, you believe the United States has to Iraq? And you have, uh, you have raised this issue as well. But, uh, uh, but Rick Welch asked that question again. I think he worked in this subject for a long time in Iraq at reconciliation. He knows what is needed in, in Iraq, and he knows that there is an obligation. Uh, he studied law, I think. He knows that there is an obligation, a legal obligation for the uh, Americans towards Iraq. If it's not going to be raised now, it will be raised some other times. And I hope we will not go to that extent. I hope that the uh, cooperation between America and, and Iraq will continue in order to solve the problem that's been created. We don't want to go to the past and concentrate on it. Let us look for the future and how could America and Iraq work together to stop violence, to make an inclusive government, to make a fair and justice in, in Iraq. And I know that your rule now is different from your rule before. I know that you are limited in your you know, power towards the government and the politicians. But still, you have, you have uh, uh, a relation with some of 
your partners that you work with for such a long time, they need you and you need them, and you could form a, 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 you know, a source of cooperation in order to fix the problems we are talking about. And fixing that, those problems are not that big issue, actually. Mm -hmm. If I am in the other's position, I will do it right away. I will lose nothing. I will keep myself in power, but I will let the other people be pleased. Nothing is going to be lost. Lost. Nothing lost. Uh, Michael Keith um, asks this question. You mentioned weapons play an important role, and you've emphasized not the only role. Um, how would the government of Iraq employ these weapons without further aggravating sectar sectarian divides? That is, uh, is, is there, do you have any concerns about the use of these weapons that the United States might provide? Weapon is being used before the United States has supplied the weapon. And this has to be stopped right away. Weapon has to be used against civilian. And this has to be forbidden. Michael Albin of the Library of Congress asked this question. Does the road to reconciliation lead through Iran? Who asked this question? <laughs> Michael Albin. Where is Michael? My, Michael is there. Michael. That's Michael, you know the answer, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Next question, I take that to the uh, end. Ahab al Hiti, an uh, independent, asks this question Would you approve worldwide sanctions on the Iraqi government due to corruption leading to t that leads to terrorism? Uh, we suffered a lot from the sanction. So I don't want to repeat, we Iraqis suffered a lot from the, from the sanctions. I don't want to repeat that on Iraq, but uh, I think this question is a very important one. I need the voices to be raised to the all politicians in, uh, in Iraq to sit down and make reconciliation. Otherwise, steps will be taken. Unspecified steps, but there would there should be there should be consequences. I mean, I cannot say which step now is going to be taken, but I would say that some measures are going to be taken because the absence of reconciliation in the country would affect not only Iraq, it will extend to the other regions. Deputy Prime Minister. Um, let me ask you the, the last question, or the, give you an opportunity at the end here. I think you've been very generous with your time, and I know you've got appointments on, Congress, uh, on, on Capitol Hill, and those are very important. Don't want to keep you from that, but um, uh, when you look out, you see the elections coming up. Let's assume that they are, are good ones, as in the ways that you've described. What, what kind of an Iraq? What does your country look like in two, three, four years um, if, if you can look that far and make, make a, not necessarily a prediction, but even a hope, an expectation? Well, I always hope that my country will be kept united and that the people of Iraq will live together in a peaceful way, as we always live. Uh, I assure you that we never thought of sectarianism in, in, our, in our country. We used to live in war room, in the offices, in the field, in the factories, but we don't know who is Shia and who is Sunni. This is only, that was only created after 2003. I hope that we will go to those days in which we enjoyed our life in a, in, a, in, a, in a nice environment, nice country, although we suffered from the section, from dictatorship, but uh, we lived together in a proper way. 
And you know, the intermarriage between the Sunnis and the Shia, you will be surprised at 25%. Yes. Uh, and I'm among them. <laughs> <laughs> We're very glad that your wife is here. Uh, uh, thank you. Deputy Prime Minister, we are very pleased that you've been able to join us. Uh, I want to thank you very much for that. Um, we will have an opportunity in a moment. Uh, we'll take a, a brief intermission um, and we will invite your colleagues from the Council of Representatives to, to join my colleague. Uh, Sarhang uh, Habasid, uh, who will lead that discussion. But in, uh, let me just take this opportunity to thank you and ask the audience to join me in thanking you for your time here today. Thank, thank you. Thank you.